Well, thank you for coming this evening. It's a joy to see everyone here. Uh, just immensely blessed these days. Uh, I've, I've never in my life, you know, I feel like a little child, much like Solomon, who said, I don't know how to go out or come in. And yet the Lord has uh, amazingly, uh, in a very stunning way, uh, been showing me things just as a, as a little child. Uh, just reading more than I ever have. Really enjoy reading. And then I don't read, as I was telling Ed today, I don't read just, um, just to puff my mind up at all. It takes me a long time for me to decipher things and get them uh, applied to my life. But um, it's interesting, you know, in my reading and in the internalization of what I'm reading, uh, what I aspire to is something very experiential. I want God to work in my life, you know. I don't want to just uh, have my mind full of things. So I, I'm really opposed, uh, I hope you understand this term, I'm opposed to cerebral Christianity. You know, just a lot of people get real top-heavy, you know. They know all the facts, they know the theology, and yet there's nothing practical, there's nothing that animates the spirit. And, and I want God to, to really work in my life, you know, in that capacity. And to, tonight, you know, here's another thing that has really come into focus in my life in recent days, is we have a formidable opponent. You have no idea tonight. Uh, what if you could only see the invisible, what we would be privy to. I mean, the adversary, he comes and he seeks to undo us. And so I want to speak on that tonight. I think in the light of what's going on these days, I know there's a lot of insecurity and uncertainty, uh, much uh, unrest globally. Uh, not to mention locally. Uh, I was telling somebody today, I said, I, if you remember those old black and white uh, reels of the Twilight Zone, I mean, that's the way I feel. I, I go out in public, certain places, I mean, I mean, shop after shop, store after store have been shut down, very few people out on the streets in some places, and it's just eerie, isn't it? You know? But the thing is, we've got to look beyond that. And we've got to recognize that God is in control. Now you say, well, I hear that all the time. But it's like one pastor told me, he had pastored over 40 years in a church in Machias, Maine. And I said, George, what have you learned over all these years? And I knew he'd gone through battles. He'd been attacked by people. And he said, Don, what's given me the greatest rest, the greatest truth that I've understood and walked in is that God is sovereign. And so he is in control, and he is for us. Remember that, he is for you. And we're going to talk about that tonight. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to a very familiar text in the book of Ephesians and chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now tonight, let me direct your attention, please, just so that we can cut to the chase of what God would have us see. I'm going to read just the heart of the text here without doing any damage to the context whatsoever. But in Ephesians chapter 6, I want you to look with me once again at this reality of what Paul refers to as the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, Take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer once again. Now, Father, once again, tonight we would ask that you would remind us of our position in Jesus Christ. And that Satan, before our very existence, is a defeated foe. That Christ triumphed over all principalities and powers, making a show of them openly in his death on the cross. We thank you that you've given us authority to tread underfoot all the serpents and the scorpions of the enemy. And the best Satan can do to us is to kill us, which is far better to know that we have a sure hope, a certain hope in Christ to spend eternity with Him in heaven forever and ever. What an indescribable prospect. And so tonight I pray that you might draw near. And Lord, as we pray before the service, I pray that you would rise in our midst and cause your enemies to be scattered. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's interesting, when you study the book of Ephesians, you always want to keep in mind that there are two things that stand out. Particularly in chapters 1, 2, and 3, there is what we call gospel indicatives. In chapters 4, 5, and 6, there are gospel imperatives. And you say, well, what do you mean by this? Well, gospel indicatives tell us what Jesus has done, what Jesus has accomplished, what Jesus has provided for us through his death on the cross. Whereas gospel imperatives are what Jesus has commanded in the light of that good news, of his blood atonement. He has directed us. He has commissioned us. He has commanded us to do certain things. These are the gospel imperatives. Now here's the thing you need to understand from the outset. When you begin to meditate and pray over the gospel indicatives of what Christ has done in the gospel, it gives you incentive to fulfill gospel imperatives. In other words, what motivates me to live my life to the praise of the glory of His grace is what Christ has done for me. You see, what is a driving force in my life is not WWJD, what would Jesus do? The driving force in my life is what has Jesus done? You underestimate. There is great motivation to live your life in such a way that it's a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God if you wallow in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's sad, friend, that we only know Christ's gospel in terms of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it is that. And some people don't even know that. They only know in terms of John 3.16. The message of redeeming love that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But friend, when you begin to flesh out the doctrine of the atonement of Christ and Him crucified, such things as substitutionary atonement and imputed righteousness and expiation and propitiation and the love of God, you start just reveling in those themes, I tell you, you won't lack for support. You won't lack to be in prayer meetings. You won't lack for the drive to be in church regularly. You won't lack 
for a constraint to share Christ with other people and make Him known. It's a wonderful thing. So the book of Ephesians, keep in mind that God through His Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, has given us gospel indicatives to give us gospel incentive that we might fulfill gospel commands or imperatives, okay? And so here we are, we're coming to some gospel imperatives. As Paul says, to put on the whole armor of God. Now this exhortation, brothers and sisters, is timeless. This was not just for the apostolic era. It was not just for the Reformers or the Puritans or men like Billy Sunday or Sam Jones or some of the great preachers in a bygone year. This is something relevant for everybody, not just ministers, but for lay people. We must, it's imperative for the help of our life and for the salvation of our soul and the souls of our family that we learn to put on the whole armor of God. Now, I became very acutely aware of unseen forces, particularly many years ago in a conference in Nashville, Tennessee. The pastor asked me if I would talk to a young lady who had been involved in over 25 different occultic satanic practices. He said, Don, I know you've had some experience in dealing with demons, dealing with Satan, some exorcism. And so I want to ask you, would you feel at liberty to meet with this girl? I said, as long as I have somebody with me. So I asked another man, another minister, if he would come into the office as we met with this 19-year-old girl who from all indication was definitely infested with evil spirits. I remember talking to this girl and asking, you know, what she had been involved in. And during the course of the dialogue, she told me of some of the practices that she had engaged in and had become a regular practice in her life. We began to take authority over these evil spirits. It was interesting, there was a whole different dimension in dealing with this girl's personality. It was as if there was another agent, another presence that was resident and manifest in her. But I remember one thing in particular toward the end of our meeting that night, which went for about two and a half hours. She told me, or this thing, this entity within her, this demonic spirit, I believe, told me that he had entered into this girl when she had prayed to receive Jesus. I said, you're a liar, you're a deceiver, and you're trying to deceive me. I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to tell me the truth. How did you enter into this girl? He said, I am telling you the truth. I said, how can this be? How could you enter into Leanne when she prayed to receive Jesus? He said, when she prayed... The sinner's prayer, she prayed with her lips, but she did not believe in her heart. That's frightening. There are a lot of people today that will come to the cross in their unrighteousness and they leave in their self-righteousness as sinners. They'll pray a prayer, they'll jump through hoops, they put on a facade, they begin to play church, but inside their heart, God has never done anything for them. And in the process of praying a prayer and being emotionally open to things, oftentimes there is a demonic infestation. Satan, friend, is real. He has multiple ploys to get an advantage over us and to destroy the souls of people that are outside of Christ. So I became acutely aware of the fact that there is a real live devil and he is not to be taken lightly. Now, when I read this text, there are a couple things that immediately came to my mind as I began to prepare this message. First of all, I recall the lyrics, glorious lyrics of Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. 
And let me stir up your minds in the way of remembrance in regard to that first stanza. It says, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still, for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. Do you understand tonight that Satan is not out just to rob you of a few eternal rewards in your walk with God? He is out to destroy your soul. But you say, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm secure in Christ. Friend, listen. Here is my conviction. I don't believe in one saved, always saved. Now, before you're ready to drag me out into the parking lot and stone me, listen to me out. The issue is not one saved, always saved. The issue is if saved, always saved. Yes, I believe that when a person is truly in Christ, they are eternally secure once and forever. But understand tonight, the Bible speaks much about having made a profession of faith, the importance of persevering in godliness and holiness and right living and faithfulness. And friend, you must understand that your profession of faith is very suspect and may be altogether false unless you're continuing in the faith. You're continuing in obedience. You're continuing in submission before the Lord. Okay? So Satan seeks to trip us up. And you see, his objective, friend, is not to simply just make you feel bad or deprive you of some eternal rewards. He is literally out to destroy your soul and the souls of your family. So understand some things tonight. He still seeks to work us woe. Now the second thing that comes to mind is from Pilgrim's Progress. And you remember the story of how Pilgrim, of course, is walking the straight and narrow way. He's en route to the celestial city, and he comes upon a manse late one evening, and he's seeking refuge from his fatigue. It's interesting, he's talking to this porter at a distance, and the reason he doesn't proceed is because there are two lions there. They are very ferocious that are seeking to, to prey on him, and so suddenly he draws back, he becomes afraid, and seemingly he's about to retreat when the porter calls out and says, These lions are chained. Walk straight ahead. And sure enough, he says, this is a testimony of Pilgrim, I saw not the chains. Now to me that speaks volumes and hope to me, because friend, listen. Satan cannot do anything to you or to myself unless God permits him to. He desires to sift us as wheat. He desires to do anything he can to disrupt the flow of our spirituality. But he cannot do anything to us unless God permits, because God is sovereign. He is in control over the devil. That's good news. So keep those things in mind as we look at this text tonight. Now here's some interesting thoughts. The new birth thrust every saint... I don't care whether you're a minister, I don't care if you're a seasoned saint, I don't care where you are in your spiritual life. If you're in Christ, you are a saint. And listen, the minute that you are born again into the kingdom of God, you are thrust into a spiritual warfare. Don't underestimate it. You see, the conflict, this spiritual conflict, is no imaginary game. It's not a video game that we have the choice to entertain ourselves with. It is a lifelong engagement that involves the salvation of our souls and our families. And I say this, brethren, it must not be taken lightly. Because of the potentially perilous nature of this conflict, it is vital that we handle the text, Ephesians 6, with utmost gravity. Now bear with me here, listen carefully. 
We must properly interpret the passage in its context, not assuming anything about it. It's amazing, it's like B.R. Lakin used to say, say, studying your Bible will unfit you for a lot of preaching. So don't assume or don't try to interpret this from a subjective point of view. Let the Bible stand on its own two feet. But we must, we must properly interpret the Word of God. You see, to accurately decipher every word is to feel the weight to the help of our own souls. Therefore, listen to this, I want to begin first from the approach of the objective. What does God really say in the text? Why? Why do I want to do this? Because, listen, I'm convinced that many believers miss the real impact of the truth contained here because they only see and only want to interpret it from a merely subjective, experiential point of view. In other words, they've had some experience with a sense of a demonic presence or something happened in their life that was very bizarre and they thought, man, Satan is trying to get the upper hand here. Don't interpret the text on the basis of your experience. Let the Bible speak and then what we'll do is make application, okay? But now listen. We want to begin by just giving sort of a glance, a, a sort of an interpretation of this text at a glance, okay? Let's begin in verse number 10. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now, to be strong here is not referring to our physical strength, but to something, watch now, something distinctly other. Something that is nothing short of supernatural. It's something of the world. Okay? So, we're talking about agents that are not of this world. We're talking about a power that is not of this world. Why? Because Paul goes on to remind us that this conflict... Although we're dealing with these supernatural things, these entities, our conflict is not with flesh and blood. Now bear with me here for a minute and you'll see where I'm going. Most of the time, this conflict with evil that we all encounter, that we all encounter, will involve people. Most of the time, it involves people. However, we must understand that there are unseen forces behind it all. I was amazed the other day when my co-elder spoke on social justice and the gospel, and he talked about Black Lives Matter. Have you done any research behind what is behind Black Lives Matter? It's occultism. It's witchcraft. It's satanic worship. This is who's fueling that fire. So we look at the young men and young women, both black and white, that are out there parading in a very vicious, demonic way, and we think, well, it's their fault. They're the ones that need to be put in place, and yet understand, friend, that there's unseen forces behind it all, and these things can only be conquered by the intercessory prayer of God's people. Don't curse them. Pray for them. Okay? Listen. Therefore, this military engagement calls for God-given protection and spiritual weaponry. Hence, Paul goes on to say, notice in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Now, this is a command once again. Once again, here's that gospel indicative. That is, watch now, it is not optional. It is not optional. It is a direct command from our commander-in-chief because he knows what we need far better for ourselves than what we do. So he is commanding us to put on the whole armor of God. It's not optional. It's not negotiable. It's something that God expects us to do. We're in sin if we disobey this commandment. Next phrase. Why do we do this? That you may be able to stand against the wiles 
of the devil. Now, some of us, we know what the word wiles here means, but let me refresh maybe your memory, and for those that don't, let me just say this to you. The word wiles here means methods, strategies, that which is well laid out, denoting art or craftiness. What lies behind these ploys of the devil is great demonic wisdom. He knows exactly what trap to set for each person. He says we are to be able to stand against these wiles of the devil when we put on the whole armor of God. Now, notice this. Our endurance in the warfare depends upon our diligence to keep the armor on. If we should neglect this suit of protection and become careless in clothing ourselves with it, we may well become a casualty of the conflict. Are you with me? Brothers and sisters, there are professing believers today that are just falling like flies. They were sincere in their faith. And they prayed the prayer. They asked Jesus to be their saint. They're just falling like flies. I see this. I mean, you've got your little community. You've got your small church here. But I'm seeing this all across the country and around the world. What I'm hearing. I'm telling it just blows my mind. Every time I think nothing will surprise me, I hear of another. I mean, it's wild. The diabolical scheme of Satan and how he's bringing men and women down. Tragically, in our hour, Satan runs roughshod over many professing Christians because of their great neglect of the armor of God. So Paul says in verse 12, look at this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now watch this. It is significant to note that God gives us an idea of what we're up against. Even Satan does not assume that his power is invincible, for he devises ranks of demonic ploys or activities to destroy men. He's never believed that one size or one strategy fits all. He says something uniquely devised just for you. Now, I remember one of the men at Liberty University who fell into immorality. He didn't fall into it. He chose to do it. He confessed later that he was guilty. But in his testimony, he made this statement. He said, you've always heard that Satan attacks you at your weaknesses. He said, he'll attack you at your strengths. He said, I ran one of the largest family counseling ministries in the country. And where did he attack me? In my family. And as old as you are, don't you dare think it couldn't happen to you. Paul says in verse 13, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. This implies, brothers and sisters, that we have no alternative than to avail ourselves to this impregnable military suit of clothing. Because this is the only sure way that safeguard ourselves and our families from utter destruction. Paul goes on to say this, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Think with me for a moment. Think with me for a moment. He said the word withstand means to resist. Withstand is equated with resist. In the evil day. 
And this day, interestingly enough, refers to the day of intense temptation, the day or season when you will be violently assaulted. It may be a moral enticement. It may be just a compromise of not guarding your eyes and looking upon something that will cause covetousness to rise in your heart. It may be a broken relationship. It may be financial collapse. But the evil day is coming. It's the inevitable for every believer. And if you're not putting on the whole armor of God now before it comes, you're going to have a very difficult time putting it on in the midst of the crisis. He goes on to say, the word stand means that every foe must be subdued or overcome no matter how formidable or constant they may be. And the idea, brothers and sisters, is this. The idea is that no prisoners are taken. Now watch this. Please don't miss this one thought here. Any prisoner that is taken is the potential of providing for the enemy something to ultimately bring you down. Let me share that in a more simple way. Often prisoners prove to be provisions to the detriment and the destruction of your soul. Take no prisoners, friend, when it comes to putting on the whole armor of God, when you stand against the wiles of the devil in the evil day, because the very little compromise that you protect in your life is the thing that possesses the potential of Satan using to bring you down. Your obedience must be thorough. It must be nothing short of radical. And so therefore Paul goes on to say, look at verse 14, stand, it means aggressively resist. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you take on the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And I'm skipping over a few words there just for the sake of time. But listen, here's my point. Our standing before the enemy does not depend upon our abilities, our education, or our previous victories, our successes. He's going to be relentless in attacking. And oftentimes you'll guard yourself in one area and you don't realize here he is, he's going to blindside you. We've got to put on the whole armor of God. Each aspect of this suit of defense is strategically designed to protect believers from those spiritual weapons of mass, are you with me? Of mass spiritual destruction that pose the capability of bringing a man or a woman down morally or eternally. So to complete the introduction here, you'll notice verse 18. This is something a lot of times people miss completely. Why do we put on the whole armor of God? Is it to shake ourselves from some coveted object? Is it to deal with some demonic force that we feel like is insidious and it's coming upon us to prey upon us in an oppressive way? Hmm. There are two reasons why Paul says that we're to put on the whole armor of God. And here's your power. This is your power to overcome. <laughs> Pray and watch in prayer. Look at verse 18. That's what he says. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Paul, why? Why do we put on the whole armor of God? Praying always with all prayer and supplication, another form of prayer, in the Spirit. 
Now, here's a, here's a conclusive statement here, okay? And then I want to give you just a very brief outline to, to hang our thoughts on for a moment to, that I trust will help you as it's helping me, okay? To clarify the meaning of what we've just looked at in the text, Paul is encouraging Christians to prepare themselves for the days of great spiritual assault when they will be soundly tested. And once again, friend, I, I just repeat it again. You have no idea. Don't underestimate the devil because he's coming after you. He will be coming after you. The assaults may mean intense temptation. Sometimes seasons when we will be assailed by cleverly planned enticements to weaken and destroy our soul. Most of the time, are you with me? Most of the time, the attacks that you will experience will come through your relationships with people. That's why he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But evil days will not exclusively consist of the evil one's overt attack. He will seek to beset our faith by tempting us to question the truth of God. And man, is that ever happening today? Young men who go to seminary, all of a sudden, they start questioning God. And they become some of the most profound atheists. And some people in the church, just like yours... They become disenchanted or disillusioned because somebody hurts them and they leave the church and harden their heart and now they've forsaken the faith completely. He will seek to beseech Beset our faith by tempting us to question the truth of God. And listen, if we have not armed ourselves with this weapon, with this whole armor of God, in the evil hour, it can lead to the ultimate destruction of our lives. Now, with all that said, let's just make it very simple, okay? Let me give you some things from our text that we just looked at that I hope will be an encouragement to you. There's three things here. Number one, understand that this is a call to active duty. A call to active duty. There is nothing in the passage that allows for passivity, indifference. Here's the country term, laziness. Nothing in the passage calls for laziness. Remember this, idleness tempts the devil to tempt. Laziness tempts the devil to tempt you. You let your guard down and he'll run roughshod right over you and destroy you. What emerges out of this passage is a call to take up arms. It is the trumpet of the gospel sounding the certain sound of diligence. You will notice that every admonition here in the text is fired with imperative verbs. Each one cries for immediate action. Are you with me? Now watch this. Follow with me in your Bibles for a moment. Look at these words that are very proactive. I mean intensely uh, proactive. Verse 11. Be strong in the Lord. Strong in the Lord. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. You can't just sit idly by and put it on. You got to stand to your feet. You got to take some action. You got to strive to put it on. Verse 12, take up the whole armor of God. Another very intense verb there. Verse 14, stand therefore. Verse 14, having girded your waist with truth. Gird your waist with truth. Verse 14, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, take the shield of faith. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. 
Verse 18, praying always with a prayer, with prayer. And verse 18, once again, a very intense verb. Be watchful to this end with all perseverance. Now here's what I want, I want you to see before we move to the second point. We are not simply enlisted for battle. We are thrust into a battle of unimaginable risk and hazards. Are you with me? You can't be casual about this. Listen, it is not an engagement for the weak, cowardly, or double-minded. It is always a duty that never permits a leave of absence. You don't get a leave of absence in this military warfare. You say, I need a vacation. You're not going to get it. If you do, you're a goner. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4 tells us no one engaged in this warfare entangles himself with the affairs, with the affairs, with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Think with me for a moment. See the importance of persistence in other texts that speak of our relationship with the devil. For example, James 4 and verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. What does the word resist there mean? Once again, it's an intensely proactive verb. It means to face off with resolved aggression. In the Old Testament, here was the picture. When the enemies would go out in the field to meet one another, oftentimes the term was used, set the battle in array. You know what that means? Setting the battle in array is not pictured like this. Here's the picture of setting the battle in array. You're going on the offensive. Peter says, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Boy, did he ever know something of this. Peter, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. But when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Satan did not destroy Peter, but indeed through trial he was sifted. He compromised denying his Lord for a season. And Peter says this, Peter, you don't know what you're talking about, man. You've just been to seminary, you know. You've never really experienced the hard throes of the everyday life of dealing with the devil. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he had. And here's what he said. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Then he says this, interestingly, what Paul says, resist, go on the offensive is what the word means there. Go on the offensive against him steadfast in the faith. The word steadfast, brothers and sisters, means aggressively oppose. Aggressively. You know what Tozer said? I talk back to the devil. Now don't, don't tempt the devil. I mean, don't, don't, don't be cynical toward the devil. Respect the devil. But listen, don't go around like a lot of charismatics do in rebuking the devil. You don't have no authority to rebuke the devil. You remember the book of Jude? How it says that Michael the archangel did not bring a, a railing accusation against the devil, but rather says, the Lord rebuke you. He's the only one, the ultimate authority, that can rebuke the devil. But we need to learn. Respect him, yes. But treat him with contempt. And then how about Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives even unto the death. 
All right, Satan comes and he implants these thoughts in your mind saying, you're not going to live till tomorrow morning. Somebody's going to break into your home. You're going to be on the street and all of a sudden one of these rioters are going to come over and they're going to slit your throat. All right, what's my, my recourse? I say the devil. I use a little Clint Eastwood theology. Go ahead and make my day. Peter says, if that happens, guess what? I've ceased from sinning. He says, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. So the stark reality of spiritual warfare is that we must part with the vain notion that we can conquer while being casual or unintentional. You've got to go on the offensive. Now, quickly, number two. Not only is it a call to duty, active duty, but consider with me the craftiness, the craftiness of the adversary. Once again, I cite the words of Martin Luther in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He said, His craft, His power are great, and He is armed with cruel hate. On earth is not His equal. On earth. When modern believers think of the work of the devil, some imagine a legion of orcs like you see in Lord of the Rings. Stalking them. These demonic-like creatures stalking me. While other people have a thought of paranormal activity. I mean, this is weird. This is strange. It's something supernatural. You know, there's some kind of a demonic fiend out there that's preying on me. No, friend, listen. These are not normally the ways that the God of this world displays His work. Every expression in the text suggests subtility or outright deception than an overt ploy. You see, the unseen demonic host move in a way that is undiscernible to the physical eye. And this is what I want you to see before we close, is note the words Paul uses to describe satanic maneuvers. He uses the term wiles of the devil. What does this mean? Listen, the word wiles speaks of concealed ploys of the devil. It is interesting that flesh and blood is obvious to the human eye, the physical eye, Whereas powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness are not. We can't see them. But they're there. And they're powerful. While suggests a subtle or an obscure method. His ways are characterized by the subjective or the hidden. Secondly, there's another term here. It speaks of the evil day. This refers to a day of intense assault that is out of the ordinary trials of life. Listen, we go through hardships, we go through trials, don't we? But this is something that is more extraordinary. It's more acute. It's something that rattles our cage. And it's coming. The word evil means harmful in effect or influence. It is a time or a season, brothers and sisters, of severe adversity or fiery trial, temptation in which one's faith is vexed. It speaks of a day of violent assault or intense enticement. And then there's another term here. It's the phrase fiery darts. What does this mean, literally, in the original language? What's he speaking of? It means inflamed missiles. How about that? Think in your mind. These demonic agents are unleashing these inflamed missiles into your mind, into your conscience. And what Paul, many commentators believe, may have had in mind, please listen carefully now, we're almost finished. What he may have had in mind were slender pieces of cane filled with combustible material that could be easily set on fire. They were launched by a bow with the intent of being fastened to the person so as to set the individual on fire. They were out for the jugular. They were out to kill these people. 
So the word quench here comes into play when he says we're to quench these fiery darts. It means to extinguish by a shield. In other words, they come and I have this shield of faith that I'm quenching these fiery darts with. So with all that said, let me give you a third and final thing. Consider with me the character of the overcomer. The character of the Christian that overcomes. Once again, we go back to Luther's great hymn. He goes on to say in the hymn, Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing. You ask who this may be? Christ Jesus. It is He. Lord Sabbath is His name from age to age the same, and He must win the battle. Please listen to this in closing. The character of that Christian who rivals the prince of darkness, men and women, is comprised of these components. Number one, think with me. He overcomes by strength out of his own weakness. The way you conquer is strength out of your own weakness. I recognize, first of all, I am no match for this adversary. Therefore, my weakness, it causes me to cry out to the all-sufficient one to come to my rescue and be my defender and shield and fortress during these fiery assaults of the devil. You see, to become strong in the power of his might requires a reduction of your strength. Where you're sitting back saying, man, I need, to, I need to do something about this thing, man. So you start conniving and concocting and manipulating and seeking the counsel of men. And the last thing you do is put on the whole armor of God to pray. The idea is of utter reliance that results from an intentional diminishing of our own strength. You say, well, how do I do that? I mean, how do I empty myself of my own strength? You don't worry about that, friend. Your responsibility is to draw from His strength. And that comes through prayer and pursuing Him and crying out for His help. This is what Paul meant in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Strength made perfect in weakness. I'll tell you where I'm at these days. I'm praying for weakness. I'm praying for weakness. And sometimes I get up to preach, even at my age. I'm shaking in my boots. And now I look upon it as a good thing. And I'm saying, Lord, I don't have what these people need. I'm not even sure I know what they need in the present right now. And Lord, if I get up there and I flounder and I lose my train of thought and I stutter and I stammer, then Lord, if your strength is made perfect in my weakness, then I'm all for it. Amen. Lord, I don't have all the answers in dealing with my kids. I don't know how to best shape my grandkids. I'm trying to feed them steadily the gospel these days, but friend, listen, I know things are going to start coming up the older they get. And I tell you, I'm going to need to cast myself continuously upon the wisdom of the Lord. This is an emptying of your strength. But you must be much alone with God in prayer. Much alone with God in prayer. It is a good thing, brothers and sisters, to pray for weakness. Pray for it. Pray for it. God, make me weak. I'm tired of being strong, trying to be the top dog on the block, you know, and got all the answers and, and know the most notable people, you know, to help me through these things. Listen, Lord, all that's done. I want to know you. I want to know your strength. Secondly, listen, second thing that emerges out of the text is make sure your obedience and putting on the whole armor of God is not optional. 
not optional. It's a direct command. It's not partial either. Do not resort to carnal weaponry. Don't say, all right, I'll put on the whole armor of God to pray. But at the same time, you're seeking the help. Your confidence is in men. No, friend, banish the thought. Lord, I want something done this time that is so supernatural that I'll know that you did it and I didn't concoct it. Every part of the armor of God must be put on. To neglect one piece is to be vulnerable to the enemy's suggestions and invasions to thwart your prayer life. We're to put on the whole armor of God. Why? To pray and to watch in prayer. Thirdly, learn to pray in the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, praying in the Spirit is not praying in tongues. It's not having some mystical presence to come upon you where all of a sudden you start engaging in some gibberish that you have no idea what you're saying. That's not praying in the Spirit. What does it mean? He says in verse 18 again, watch now, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Notice he says, praying always with all prayer. First of all, praying in the Spirit is constant in prayer. Constant in prayer. Praying always. In other words, my first recourse when something happens, when some fiery trial occurs, when the day of evil comes, is my only recourse I've learned, I've grown in, is to resort to prayer alone with God. Secondly, to pray in the Spirit is to pray with dead earnestness, blood earnestness. He says, praying always with all prayer. It speaks of a desperation of earnestness. And here's the idea. Please don't miss this now. It's when you get to a point that you pray in your prayer. There was a little child chorus, I think, really depicts it best. And, and, and it was sung like this. How often do I say my prayers, but do I really pray? There will come times when you pray and you pray and you Lord, I'm just not getting through, Lord. It's just so mechanical, you know, it's so scripted and it's not heartfelt or anything. And all of a sudden, there's a whole different dimension that takes over. Say, so God, I've got to have you. I'm being honest with you. God, you've got to come in this thing. And suddenly, you start praying in your prayer. Because you're praying with earnestness and you're praying in faith and with expectation that God is going to answer. It's praying in the Spirit. It means to be sensitive to His promptings and direction. It's what many in church history, many of the great men and women of God that God so mightily used from their knees, from their knees, they refer to it as an enlargement in prayer. An enlargement in prayer. You, you know anything about that? And then finally, there's an astute watchfulness. Remember He says, praying always, but watching in prayer. It means, it suggests vigilance. That's what the word vigilance means, is watchfulness. Lord, I'm not underestimating my eternal foe here. I know there's something that he's conspiring. And Spirit of God, I pray that you would help me and make up for the deficit of my weakness that I don't know how to pray as I ought. But you pray according to the will of God. And I'm good with that whether I see what's happening or not. God, you've got to do it. It denotes a persistence in prayer. But what I want to leave you with tonight is all of this is fueled by a spirit of prayer and faith. Faith. When John Piper was in Sun Valley, California, preaching for John MacArthur, Piper shared the story of how one day he had an appointment with MacArthur in his office, walked up the steps into the second story of the office building and quickly darted into 
MacArthur's office and he said, I looked over on the side there and there was this, there was this figurine, this statue. And he said, all I could do is get a glimpse of what the man was doing. He had his fist clenched and his eyes were tilted toward heaven. And he had this, this painful look on his face. He was in agony. He was praying with great intensity. And, and Piper said, I noticed there was something written at the bottom of the statue. And I just assumed that the words were, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But later when he came out of MacArthur's office, he went back over and he looked at the statue and then he read the words. It was not a sinner crying out to God for mercy to save him. It was a saint crying out to God these words. I will trust. And that's what makes it all operative, friend that unleashes the power of God to combat the evil one, is at times you'll have all these wicked imaginations come in your mind as you pray and say, there's no sense in praying. It's all in vain. Give up. God's not going to do anything. And yet you have to stay the course and say, I will trust and watch God work. Let's pray together. Now, Father, would you be pleased to use these words tonight to give hope and encouragement, to bring obedience and faith into the lives of your people. Lord, that when the evil day and days come, and they will come. May they have a shield and a defender through the armor of God in Jesus Christ. We thank you tonight that you've given us this precious armor of God. And we didn't even go into these six aspects of this armor. But Father, thank you that we can put on the breastplate of righteousness and the girdle of truth and our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and thank you for the helmet of salvation and the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. All these things pertaining to the gospel, to gospel truth that we might be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one and to pray and to watch in prayer that our prayers might become so effectual that we will be able to stand in the evil day for your glory. Bless your people now in Jesus' name. Amen.